Hey guys, Mosh here. I'm excited to let you know that next week I'm going to publish a new course on Udemy called Build a Real World Application with ASP.NET Core and Angular 2. You don't need any prior knowledge of ASP.NET Core, but you need to be familiar with ASP.NET MVC 5, Entity Framework 6, and Angular 2. This course is ideal for developers familiar with ASP.NET MVC 5 who want to quickly learn about ASP.NET Core in the context of a real world application. Now, depending on your level of experience, there are two ways to watch this course. You can watch it as an educational program, just like my other courses, or if you have a bit more experience or are willing to challenge yourself, you can be part of my 60 day challenge program. So it's like you and I are part of a team. We're working together on a real world project. I'm your team leader. And every week I give you a challenge or a task to complete. You have one week to complete this task. And then the following week, I will add a new section to my course and there you will see how I would complete that task in a step-by-step -step fashion. Now, the price for this course is initially going to be $50 because initially I'm going to publish only the first section. And then every week I will add a new section and the price is going to increase to about $150 to $200. However, if you join my mailing list now, you can get the course for only $15. So click on the link in the video description and you will immediately get an email with coupons to my other courses and next week when i publish this course i will send you another email to get the course for 15 dollars and by the way if you don't get the email uh, make sure to check your spam folder or register with another email and one last thing a lot of you ask me why not pluralsight because pluralsight owns content exclusively so my udemy courses i cannot put them on pluralsight they are for udemy and my pluralsight courses are for pluralsight so this course, Build a Real World Application with ASP.NET Core and Angular 2 is going to be for Udemy and it's going to be published next week. Next, I'm going to show you the first hour of this course. You can see exactly what I'm going to teach you in that course, what are the requirements and whether this course is for you or not. And remember, if you want to get the course for $15, click on the link in the video description to join my mailing list. All the best and have a great day. Hi, my name is Mosh Hamedani, and I'm going to be your instructor over the next few hours. In this course, you're going to learn how to build a real-world application with Angular 2 on the client and ASP.NET Core on the server. By the end of watching this course, you will have all the necessary skills to integrate these two frameworks and build real-world applications. Now, in this course, I'm going to take a fairly different approach from my other courses. This course is part of a 60-day challenge program. So we're going to simulate a real world coding scenario together. It's like you and I are part of a team and I'm your team leader. And for a period of two months, every week, I'm going to give you a task or a challenge, which involves building a small piece of functionality. And then I will also complete the same task myself and publish my coding videos in the following week. So you can compare your solution with mine. Now, if you're an experienced developer, you may start coding straight away complete each task on your own, and then review my solution. Or if you are more of a beginner developer, you may prefer to watch me complete each task first, and then you can code and repeat the task on your own. It's entirely up to you. Now, this course is currently in pre-release mode, and that's the beginning of our next 60-day challenge. So right now, only the first section is published, and I'll be publishing new sections on a weekly basis. If you don't like the weekly gaps between sections and prefer to watch the course as a whole, that's perfectly fine. But you have to wait for almost two months until I complete all sections. Next, I'm going to talk about the scope of this course. Before we get started, let me clarify a few things about what this course is and what it isn't so you have the right expectations. First is that our focus will be on building a real-world application and not to explore all features of Angular or ASP.NET Core. Because each application, depending on its requirements, often needs a subset of features in any given frameworks. So it's impossible for me to talk about all the features of, let's say, ASP.NET Core or any framework core and how they are different from their previous versions. That's not the scope of this course and requires a separate course. In this course, I'm assuming you're familiar with Angular 2 and the previous versions of ASP.NET and Entity Framework, that is ASP.NET MVC 5 and Entity Framework 6. 
and want to quickly get up to speed with .NET Core in a hands-on and pragmatic way. So our focus here is on building a real-world application using the latest technologies. Now, this app, even though it's a real-world application, it's not a complete and sophisticated app with a fancy user interface like those popular web apps out there. These apps, especially those with complex features and fancy user interfaces, are built by a team of developers working together for several months or longer. Also, in such teams, there are other practices like continuous integration, continuous deployment, automated testing, and so on. So it's not something that I, as one person, can demonstrate within 7 to 10 hours. And even if I extend the scope of this course to 50 or 100 hours, it's not going to be useful because both you and I will lose momentum and get lost in detail along the way. So from a teaching point of view, this is not going to be effective. Instead, we're going to build an application with a few basic functions mostly centered around CRUD operations. So you're going to learn how to build forms with Angular that talk to backend APIs built with ASP.NET Core. And to make the application more interesting, I've included a few complex use cases based on the student's feedback, like cascading dropdown lists and dynamically rendered checkboxes and so on. Also, we're going to look at filtering, sorting, and paging data. We're going to look at handling and login errors, displaying toast notifications, but note that this is not real-time notifications coming from the server, just a toast notification. We're also going to look at authentication and authorization with multiple roles having different permissions. We're going to look at preventing CSRF security attacks. We're going to look at uploading photos with progress bars, displaying charts, dialog boxes, and so on. Depending on your level of experience, you may find this the right level for you, or you may think this is too easy. So I'm explaining this to make sure you're at the right level for this course. If you're looking for an application with a complex domain and want to learn about domain-driven design or design patterns, continuous integration, automated testing, this course is not what you're looking for. Having said that, you're welcome to extend this application and add new complex features, but that's not within the scope of this course. Also, this application is going to have a very simple user interface. So our focus is not on something that is visually outstanding. That's the job of a UI designer, not a programmer. If you're good at designing user interfaces, it's a bonus. It helps you stand out from the rest of the crowd, but it's not something that is expected from you. And one last thing about the 60-day challenge program. As the title of this program says, this is all about challenging you and helping you take your coding skills to the next level. So as you're building these features, you may get stuck, you may get compile time or runtime errors, or certain things may not work on your machine. You're welcome to use the discussion board to post your questions, but you cannot expect me or others to help you solve these issues. That's your job as a developer. Because in the real world, when you are part of a team, every single day you will encounter tens of issues like that. There, you don't have me or other students in the course to help you. So you need to do your own research and find a solution. And the first thing you need to do is to jump on Google and type the error message or the problem. I can guarantee that in more than 90% of the cases, you can find your answer on the first page of Google. And guess what? That's exactly what I do when I encounter issues. So if you're going to post your question and expect me to help you, chances are I may not know the reason why you're having a problem on your machine because I don't know everything. Yes, in this course, I'm your instructor, but outside this, I'm a student myself. So when you ask me something that I don't know, I have to jump on Google and do research on your behalf. And this will prevent you from growing. If you want to take your coding skills to the next level, if you want to get a better job with better pay, you have to earn it. And yes, it's not easy. It takes time. Sometimes you have to stay up till 3 a.m. in the morning. Nobody said it's easy. But if you're passionate, if you're determined, you can earn it. You can be a senior developer with a good job, with a good pay. And that's the whole purpose of this 60-day challenge program, to push you out of your comfort zone. Okay, now that you know exactly what this course is and what it isn't, let's take a look at the prerequisites in more detail. In order to take this course, you should have at least three months experience with Angular 2, ASP.NET MVC 5, and Energy Framework 6. But you don't need any prior knowledge of ASP.NET Core or Energy Framework Core. 
I'm going to introduce you to these frameworks in a pragmatic way along the way. So, more specifically, when it comes to Angular 2, you should know your components, services, modules, dependency injection, property and event binding, forms, and routing. When it comes to ASP.NET MVC, you should know your controllers, actions, model binding, HTTP verbs like get, post, put, and delete. And finally, when it comes to any framework, you should know your code first migrations, link, and DB context. So if there are areas that you are not quite familiar with, I highly recommend you to watch my related courses on Udemy. That includes Angular 2 with TypeScript for beginners, the complete ASP.NET and MVC 5 course, and any framework 6 in depth. All right, enough introduction. Now let's take a look at the requirements for the application we're gonna build. So we're going to build a web application for an imaginary vehicle dealer called Vega. Let's say you want to sell your car. You call Vega, talk to someone on the phone, and ask them to register your car in their database. Other people who are buyers can browse the vehicles in their database, and if they're interested in a vehicle, they will call Vega and talk to someone on the phone, and the rest of the process happens offline at that stage. So this is the big picture. Now, as part of recording a vehicle for sale, we need to know its make, its model, its features. So basically there are a sort of standard features like ABS brakes, airbags, bottle holders, and so on. So here we have a many-to-many -many relationship between vehicles and features. A vehicle can have many features and a feature may be available in many different vehicles. We also need to record whether a vehicle is registered or not, the owner's name and contact information, and finally, we should also be able to upload one or more photos for each vehicle. So the simplest solution to this problem is to have a page where we see all the vehicles in the database. On this page, we should be able to filter and sort vehicles. If there are more than 10 vehicles, we should display them in pages. And from this page, we should be able to click a vehicle to see its details. We should also have a page to add a new vehicle to the database. Also, in terms of authorization, we need two different roles here. One is the moderator role, and this includes Vega personnel who talk to sellers and buyers on the phone. They can create, update, and delete vehicles in the database. We also need an admin role, and anyone in this role has additional privileges. For this imaginary app, we're gonna display a report of vehicle sales by their makes in a pie chart like this. So anyone with admin access can view this report. And finally, if someone hasn't logged in, they should only be able to browse the vehicles. So we're gonna hide the buttons for creating, updating, and deleting vehicles here. Okay, now that you know what we're gonna build, let's start setting up our development environment. All right, to set up your development environment, first you need to head over to microsoft.com slash net slash core. On this page, you can see the installation instructions for your operating system. So if you're a Windows user, the simplest way is to install Visual Studio 2017. And this will bring all the components you need. So you don't need to do anything else. But in this course, I'm not going to use Visual Studio. I'm going to use Visual Studio Code, which is a very lightweight and fast editor. It's not a full IDE like Visual Studio, but it's a very powerful cross-platform code editor. So whether you're using Windows, Linux, or Mac, you can use Visual Studio Code, which we call VS Code. Now, what I want you to do is, in this course for the next few hours, forget about Visual Studio, and let's build this application using VS Code. I know that you might be used to using Visual Studio, but trust me, VS Code is much better. In fact, I personally have not used Visual Studio for over a year. So, if you're on Windows on this page, go to Command Line, you need to download and install .NET Core SDK. And then to get Visual Studio Code, simply head over to code.visualstudio.com. Now back to this page. If you're a Linux or a Mac user, once again, you can go to this page. And on this page, you can see the instructions for installing .NET Core on your version of Linux. The instructions are very easy. You simply copy paste a few commands in terminal and download .NET SDK. And once again, you head over to code.visualstudio.com to get VS Code. 
once you install VS Code, you need to add a few extensions so you can write C Sharp code in it. So, first we need to go to the command palette. On Mac, the shortcut is Shift, Command, and P. On Windows, it's Shift, Control, P. So here's the command palette. Type install ext, short for extension. And now if you scroll down, you can see this command here, install extensions. Here you can see the extensions that I have installed. So I've got this Angular V2 TypeScript snippets. And with this, we can easily create an Angular component or a service by using a code snippet. And I'm gonna show you how this works later in the course. So to install this extension or any other extensions, simply type its name here, like Angular V2. And now you can see all the extensions available in VS Code Gallery. In front of each extension, you see this install button. So simply install it, and then you need to reload VS Code for the extension to take effect. Now let's go back and see what other extensions I have installed here. I've got another extension, ASP.NET Helper, which makes it easier to develop ASP.NET MVC applications. I've got auto import, which is extremely powerful. When you're writing TypeScript code, you have to constantly go on top of the file and add import statements. With this extension, you can automatically import the classes you have used in the current module. Again, I'm gonna show you how this works later in the course. I also have Beautify, which is for formatting JavaScript and HTML code. It's not really essential, but it's a nice thing to have. Now C Sharp and C Sharp extensions are the two essential plugins that you need to install. It will give you syntax highlighting, code completion, and so on. I also have Docker here, but this is not necessary. It just gives you syntax highlighting when you are working with Docker files. Here's another extension, which is optional, MS SQL. So with this, you can connect to a SQL Server database, look at your tables, write queries, and so on. And finally, here's another extension, REST Client. Again, this is optional. With this, you can call RESTful endpoints. Now, these are the extensions that I have been using, but there are hundreds or thousands of extensions available in VS Code Gallery. So feel free to go and explore them on your own. And now finally, we need to install a couple of node packages. One is Yeoman, which is a web scaffolding tool for modern web applications. So in Visual Studio, when you create a new project, you automatically get a bunch of folders and files that come from a template. VS Code doesn't have this feature. So we need to use Yeoman to generate a template for our new project. So npm install dash G Yo. Now Yo is just an engine. We can install templates on top of this engine. So the template we're gonna use for an ASP.NET Core and Angular 2 application is called generator dash ASP.NET Core dash spa. So let's quickly recap. If you wanna use Visual Studio, you need to install Visual Studio 2017. Otherwise, if you don't wanna use Visual Studio, which is the approach I'm gonna take, first you need to install .NET Core SDK, then you need to install VS Code as your editor, you add the extensions that I told you about, and finally you install Yo and generator ASP.NET Core SPA. Now, on top of all these, we also need SQL Server. When you install Visual Studio 2017, it automatically comes with a lightweight version of SQL Server, which is called SQL Express. If you're using a Mac or Linux, you don't have Visual Studio 2017. So you need to install SQL Server using a Docker image. And that's what I'm gonna show you in the next lecture. Okay, in order to install SQL Server on Mac OS or Linux, we need to use a tool called Docker, which basically automates and simplifies the deployment of applications. And it solves the issue that your application works on your machine, but when you deploy it to a different machine, it doesn't work. With Docker, we package our application along with all its dependencies and configuration settings into an image. And then we can deploy this image to a different machine with only one command. This command will load our application with all its dependencies into what we call a container. Now SQL Server for Linux comes as a Docker image which means the software along with all its dependencies are packaged inside this image. And we're gonna use this image to install it on our machine. So if you haven't installed Docker, simply head over to docker.com. 
On Docker website, go to this page, get Docker. And here you can find downloads for Windows, Mac OS, and different distributions of Linux. Now, after you install Docker, the first thing you need to do is to configure the memory allocation. So here's the Docker icon, click. You can see Docker is running. Sometimes you may run into issues. You can simply restart it here. Now let's go to preferences. On this page, in the advanced tab, look, here I have set the memory to four gigabytes. By default, it's two gigabytes. So you need to increase it to four gigabytes in order to run SQL Server image. Once you do that, it's gonna take a few seconds until Docker is restarted. Now in terminal, let's make sure Docker is running. So simply type Docker, beautiful. Now we need to pull the SQL Server image from Docker registry. So sudo docker pull Microsoft slash ms SQL dash server dash Linux. With this, we download the SQL Server image into our machine. All right, now we wanna run this image inside the container. So sudo docker run. We need to set an environment variable dash E except underline EULA, which stands for end user license agreement. We set this to Y. And note that I have put this environment variable inside single quotes. Next, we need to set another environment variable. So dash E, this one is SA password. And here we need to use a complex password. If you use a weak password, you're gonna get a runtime exception. And I'm gonna talk about that later in this video. So to make sure that you will have a smooth experience as you're going through this course, use the password that I'm gonna use in this video. My with capital M, complex with capital C, password with capital P, exclamation mark, two, three, four and close the single quote. Next, we need to map a port in our container to a port in our host machine. So dash P for the port, 1433 to 1433. So we're mapping the port 1433 in our container to this port on our host machine. And we're gonna use this port when connecting to SQL Server from our web application. Now, if you're using Linux, you can also map a volume in the container to a volume on your host machine. And this will allow you to persist your database between container executions. So if you restart your container, if you restart your machine, your database is gonna stay there. Unfortunately, at the time of recording this video, this feature is not supported on Mac. However, if you're on Linux, you add dash V for mapping the volume. First, you add the volume on the host machine, like user, my database, that's the folder, that's the path, colon to map, and then you add slash var slash opt slash MSSQL. Once again, this doesn't work on Mac, so I'm gonna remove it. Next, we add dash D to run this as a background service. And finally, we need to add the name of our image. That's the image we downloaded earlier. So Microsoft slash MSSQL dash server dash Linux. Okay, beautiful, SQL Server is running. Now here, unlike Windows, we don't have SQL Server Management Studio. So if you wanna connect your database, there are two ways. If you're on Linux, head over to this link on the screen, bit.ly slash SQL Server Tools. This is a page on Microsoft website. And here you can see the instructions for installing SQL Server command line tools for various distributions of Linux. But if you're on a Mac, you can use SQL Pro, which is similar to SQL Server Management Studio. So simply head over to macsqlclient.com. And by the way, this is a commercial application. There is a trial version, which is I think about 30 days, and then you need to get a license, but that's reasonably cheap. It's only about 100 Australian dollars, which is about perhaps 70 US dollars. Once you run SQL Pro, you can go to connect. On this window, go to new. Here we add the server name, which is localhost. For authentication, we're gonna use SQL Server Authentication with SA as the username, and password is going to be my complex password, exclamation mark, two, three, four. Save, beautiful. 
This shows that our server is online. So we connect to the server. Now currently we don't have any databases here, but later in the course, when we create our database, we can come back here, look at our tables, look at our data, run queries and so on. Now, what if something goes wrong while you're running this SQL Server image? Let me show you how to troubleshoot this problem. So I have opened another terminal window. I want to show you the Docker containers that are currently running. So Docker PS. You can see I have one container. This is the ID of my container. This is the image that this container is based on, which is Microsoft SQL Server Linux. Now I'm going to stop this container. So Docker stop. And then I need to add the container ID. We can only use the first three or four letters. So E8CF. Now, one of the issues that you may run into is that you run the SQL Server image, but it automatically terminates. So when you run Docker PS, you don't see anything. And then you can run Docker PS A to see all the previous containers. And here you can see I had this container that terminated 29 seconds ago. So that's one of the issues you may run into. So when you use the SQL Pro or SQL Server command line tools, the server is not running. Then you come to the terminal, you run Docker PS and the container is not there. What happened? So let's simulate a scenario where you run into an issue. So I'm going to run the Docker again, but this time I'm going to use a weak password. So sudo docker run dash e accept underline eula, set it to y another environment variable as a password. I'm going to set it to one, two, three, four. Map the port, run it as a daemon, and here's the image name, server Linux. Nothing happened here. We just got a container ID. So docker ps, and the container is not there. It terminated automatically. So we need to find the log for this container and then copy it somewhere in our host machine. So let me go to the desktop here, create a folder, log. Now I need the ID for the last container. So once again, docker ps a, which is short for all. Okay, so here's the last container ID, b35f. So now docker cp, short for copy, b35f colon. And our log is inside this path in the container, slash var, slash opt, slash ms sql, slash log, slash error log. That's the name of the file. Now we want to copy this to the current folder. Now you can see here in this folder, we have this error log file. We can open this with VS Code or any other editors. So code, period. And here's our log. So if you scroll to the bottom of this log, you can see this error here, password validation failed. The password does not meet SQL Server password policy requirements. And that's the reason we couldn't start this container. All right, our environment is set up. Next, we're gonna create our ASP.NET Core project. Okay, now let's create a new project. So I'm gonna create a new folder here, Vega. Go inside this folder and then use yeoman to generate a project. So yo, and then we add the name of our template, which is ASP.NET Core dash spa. So all yeoman templates, their NPM package start with generator dash, but the actual template name doesn't have generator dash. All right, so this is yeoman and the version of my ASP.NET Core template is 0.8.7. The first question here is the type of framework we want to use on the client side. We've got Angular, Aurelia, Knockout, React, React with Redux, and Vue. So I'm going to use Angular. The next question is about the type of project we want to use. So previously, before the final release of Visual Studio 2017, Microsoft introduced a new project type, which is a JSON file called project.json. They were working on this as a replacement for csproj files. Because csproj was very complicated, very heavy, whereas this project.json is very clean, very lightweight, and consistent with other frameworks. However, in the final release of Visual Studio 2017, Microsoft decided to drop project.json 
and go back to those CS proj files. So this project.json is only here for legacy reason and all the future projects will be based on CS proj. So let's select this one here. Next question is about unit tests. Do you want to include them? Not at this stage. Now the project name, which is the same name as the folder. Okay, Yeoman created a bunch of files and folders here. And now it's going to npm to download and install all the node modules here. Okay, our project is ready. Now let's run it. There are two ways to run this project. One way is here in the terminal. So from the project folder, we execute .NET run. So this will build our application and then launch a web server at this address, localhost port 5000. So when we navigate to this address, this is what we get. It's a very basic web application using Angular 2 on the client and ASP.NET Core on the server. In the nav bar, we have three pages here, home, counter, and fetch data. This page shows an example of an API built with ASP.NET Core and an Angular component that consumes that API. So all this data you see in this table are coming from the server. Now we're not going to work with these pages. We're going to delete them. We're going to build an application from scratch. Now there is a second way to run our application. So here in the terminal, I want to stop this process. So we press Control and C. Now I want to open this in VS Code. So code period. And this will open up Visual Studio Code pointing at the current folder. Now, chances are this may not work on your machine. Let me show you how to fix this problem. So just open up VS Code manually, go to the command palette. So Shift, Command and P on Mac or Shift, Control P on Windows and search for command. The first item is install code command in path. So when you execute this, then you need to restart your terminal window and then the path will be affected. So you can go to any folder and type code, period. Now, the second way to run our application is from inside VS Code. So if you don't want to switch back and forth between the terminal, you can do it here. So press Control and backtick, which is the key before number one on your keyboard. So here inside VS Code, we have our terminal. And once again, we can run .NET run here. Next, we're going to look at the files and folders in this project. Terminal window is still open and we can hide it by pressing Ctrl and backtick again. Okay. Now we can open up the files and folders panel by pressing Command and B on Mac or Ctrl B on Windows. So let's quickly explore what we have in this project. This client app folder is where we have the client side code, the Angular app. So we have this app folder, we have our app module, we have our components exactly like other Angular applications. We also have controllers and views, which belong to ASP.NET Core, exactly like ASP.NET MVC 5. We have a new folder, .root, and this is where we put the public assets of our application for the client side. So here we have the icon for our application. We also have this dist or distributable folder. And inside this folder, we have a couple of JavaScript files. One is main-client, and this is the compilation of our Angular application into JavaScript. We also have vendor.js, which is the compilation of all the third-party libraries here. And similarly, we have vendor.css, which is the compilation of all third-party style sheets in this project. So in your applications, you need to put the public assets inside this .root folder. That includes any images, fonts, icons, and so on. Now, this is different from the previous version of ASP.NET. So in ASP.NET MVC 5, the project root was considered the root of the web application. And then if we wanted to exclude some folders, we had to blacklist them. Now in ASP.NET Core, Microsoft took a different approach. So the project root is blacklisted, and this root folder is whitelisted. With this structure, the chances of something private being accidentally exposed to the outside is reduced. Okay, let's see what else we have here. We have this app settings.json. So in ASP.NET Core, this is where we store our application settings. In the previous version, we use web.config for that. 
And also here we have a hierarchy. So you can see we have multiple levels here. We have logging. Under that we have log level. And under that we have these three key value pairs. In web.config we didn't have this hierarchy. So we had a bunch of key value pairs under app settings. And if you wanted to create a hierarchy, it was a little bit complicated. But in ASP.NET Core, this is inherently supported and it's really easy to access these settings, as I will show you later in the course. Now we have a couple of new files here, program and startup, and this is where our application starts. There's more detail involved, so I'm gonna talk about that in the next lecture. So let's move on. Here we have our csproj file, and this is a project file that Visual Studio recognizes. So if you don't wanna use VS Code, you can open this project in Visual Studio 2017. Next is our web.config, and you can see it's really simplified. There is nothing happening here. We only have system.webserver, which is for configuration of IIS, and nothing else. And finally, we have a couple of Webpack configuration files. So Webpack, if you have worked with Angular CLI, you should be familiar with that. It's a bundler for client-side code. So it can compile and minify all our JavaScript and stylesheet files. Now in this code, we are basically telling Webpack where our source files are, how they should be processed, and where they should be stored. For example, here we have a property called public path, which is set to our dist folder. So with this configuration, when Webpack bundles our client-side code, it will store it inside this folder, as I showed you earlier, which is under root. Now for the most part, you don't need to modify this Webpack configuration file. But sometimes in some projects, you may need to modify this configuration. That's beyond the scope of this course. You need to look at Webpack documentation. And finally, we have one more Webpack file, which is webpack.config.vendor.js. So in this file, we have the configuration for compiling all the third party libraries. So let's have a quick look here. If you scroll down under entry vendor, here you can see all the third-party libraries. So we've got Angular, Bootstrap, and so on. So in the future, when we want to add the third-party library, we're going to come back and add it to this file. So this is the basic project structure. In the next lecture, I'm going to talk about application startup. All right, now let's take a look at this program.cs. If you have built console applications with C-sharp, this file should look familiar to you. So in every console application, we have a class called program with a method called main, which is the entry point to our application. ASP.NET Core applications are similar to console applications in that regard. So here in the main method, over these few lines, we are configuring and running a web server to host our application. ASP.NET Core comes with two in-process HTTP server implementations. One is Kestrel, which is cross-platform. It can run on Mac, Windows, and Linux. And the other is WebListener, which is only for Windows. Now, Kestrel is a new web server. It doesn't have all the features of IIS or Apache. It's not very secure, but it's good enough to be used in an internal network. So if you're building an application for internal use, you can use Kestrel. But for a public-facing website, you need to put Kestrel behind IIS on Windows or Apache on Linux. Now, the explanation of details of that is beyond the scope of this course. But all I want you to take away is that Kestrel is an in-process HTTP server implementation that comes with ASP.NET Core. Now back in the main method, here we're telling to use Kestrel. We're specifying the root of our application. We're enabling IIS integration and specifying the startup class. Finally, when we build the host, we run it. And at this point, Kestrel starts listening on port 5000 of localhost. Now let's take a look at the startup class. So with command and P on Mac or control and P on Windows, we can easily find a file here, startup. Now here we have two methods that are automatically called at runtime. One is configure services and the other is configure. Configure services is used for dependency injection. You should be familiar with dependency injection in Angular 2. So in Angular, if our components have dependencies that should be provided to their constructor, we register these dependencies as providers at a module. We have the exact same concept here. So in ASP.NET Core, 
If our controllers have dependencies that should be provided in their constructor, we need to register them here. So this method has a parameter of type iServiceCollection, which is a container for all the dependencies in our application. So here, I can register a dependency like this, services.addTransient. Now don't worry about what is this method, just look at its syntax. This is a generic method with two generic parameters. The first one is an interface, like iRepository. And the second one is an implementation, like repository. With this, we're registering repository as an implementation of this interface, iRepository. And then anywhere in our application, if we have iRepository in the constructor of a class, the runtime will create an instance of the repository class and injects it into that class. So this is dependency injection. Now the second line here, add MVC, if you look at the implementation of this method, there, there are a bunch of statements like this. So when we call this method, it registers a bunch of interfaces and their implementation that are part of ASP.NET MVC or ASP.NET Core itself. Okay, now let's move on. Now the second method, configure. Over the first two lines here, we're configuring the logging of our application. So we add console as a log. So anytime we write something to the log, it appears on the console right here. And this is good for development. But in a real world application in the production environment, you want to use a persistent log. So we can add file system, database, or a remote source. We can register those logs here. Now the second line is adding a debug logger. So anytime we have debug.write line, it will appear in our log. Now in the rest of this method, we configure the request processing pipeline. So when a request comes in the web server, imagine it goes through a pipeline. In this pipeline, there are multiple components, which we call middleware. Each middleware is like a function. It looks at the incoming request. And if it's interested in that request, it will do something with it. Otherwise, it just skips. Now in the previous version of ASP.NET, in ASP.NET MVC 5, our request processing pipeline was fairly heavyweight, and we didn't have control over configuring this middleware. In ASP.NET Core, we can customize this request processing pipeline and add only the middleware that we need. And this way, we can improve the performance of our application because CPU resources are not wasted for middleware that we don't need. Let's take a look at a few examples. So here, if you're in the development environment, and by the way, I'm going to talk about different environments in the next lecture. So if you're in the development environment, we add a couple of middleware. One is developer exception page, which renders an exception with all its details. And the other is Webpack dev middleware. So anytime we change one of our client side files, like a CSS or a JavaScript file, Webpack will automatically compile that and push the changes in the browser. So we don't even need to reload the page. This is called hot module replacement. And these two middleware are only used in the development environment. We don't want this in the production. So this way we can configure what middleware we want to have in our request processing pipeline. Here's another middleware. Use static files. With this, we'll be able to serve static files like images, style sheets, and so on. So if I comment out this line, we won't be able to serve any images or style sheets from our application. And this is a middleware that every ASP.NET application needs. And finally, the last middleware is MVC. So MVC is nothing but a middleware. When a request comes in, this middleware looks at the request and based on our routes, it will forward it to an action in a controller. That's MVC. So when setting up this MVC middleware, we have a Lambda expression where we define our route template. And that's all about middleware. Now, for the most part, you don't really need to modify any of this stuff here. This is just boilerplate code. But I wanted you to know what middleware is and where you can configure the middleware for your application. Next, I'm going to talk about the concept of different environments, like development, staging, and production. All right, now let's talk about environments. So when we run .NET run, note that my hosting environment is set to development here. So in ASP.NET Core, we have this concept of environments. We have development environment, 
staging, and production. In ASP.NET and MVC5, we didn't really have this concept built into the framework, and we had to do some tricks with web.config to implement this. Now, in the last lecture, I told you that when we are in the development environment, we have this Webpack dev middleware, and this enables hot module replacement. So anytime we change our client-side files, like HTML, CSS, and TypeScript, Webpack detects the changes, does any necessary compilation, and pushes the changes into the browser, so we don't have to reload the page. Let me show you how this works. So in the browser, at localhost port 5000, I'm gonna go to this fetch data page. Now I'm gonna open up Chrome Developer Tools. This is our console tab. Note that here we have this message, HMR connected. HMR stands for Hot Module Replacement. If your machine is configured as the staging or production environment, you are not going to see this message. Now I'm gonna show you how to change the environment for your machine later in this video. So back in VS Code, I'm gonna to go to fetchdata.component.html. Here I'm gonna add a two in the title for this page. Save. In the console tab, you can see that Webpack rebuilt our bundle. Below that, you can see the updated modules. So these are the modules that are affected as a result of this simple change. So our fetchdata.component.html, the component that uses that, our app module, and boot-client.ts. So these files are modified, they're compiled, and the changes are automatically pushed to the browser. So back in our application, you can see the updated title, and I didn't refresh the page. So with Webpack Dev Middleware, anytime you modify your client-side code, assuming that you are in the development environment, changes are automatically pushed to the browser and you don't need to refresh. That's great, I totally love it. Now here's the thing. When you create a project using the approach I showed you in this section, your machine will not be in the development environment. If you create a project with Visual Studio 2017, there is a setting there that marks your machine as a development machine. So how can we change this? If you're on Windows, you can open up your terminal and type set ASP.NET Core underline environment to development. This is an environment variable. And ASP.NET looks at the value of this variable to determine your environment. Now, if you're on Mac or Linux, you type export ASP.NET Core underline environment and you set it to development. Then when you execute .NET run, your hosting environment should be development. However, this approach affects only the current session, the current terminal. So if I open up a new terminal window and run .NET run, my environment is not gonna be development. It's gonna be production. There is a different approach to setting this environment variable at the machine level. On Windows, you need to go to control panel, system, advanced system settings, and there, there is a button for adding environment variables. Now, I don't have Windows here, so you need to do it on your own. It's really easy. If you get lost, you can simply Google it. There are tons of videos and tutorials on this topic. On Mac OS and Linux, you go to your home directory. So this is my home directory. Now here, we need to edit our bash profile. So code to open up VS Code, dot bash underline profile. Note that at the end of this profile, I have added export ASP.NET Core underline environment to development. This will apply this environment variable at the machine level, and I don't have to repeat this step every time in a terminal window. So here's a critical step. I want you to stop watching the videos now and go ahead and set this environment variable at your machine level. This is critical because later in the course, when you're working on the client side code, if you're in the production environment, you keep changing the code and saving and refreshing your browser, but you don't see your updates. So make sure to change the value of this environment variable to development at the machine level. So later you won't have any problems. All right, this Webpack dev middleware only deals with the client side code. So if you modify server side code, it's not gonna be notified. So I'm gonna to go to home controller. In the index action, I'm just gonna throw an exception. Save. Now back in the browser, if 
I refresh the page, I don't see my change because our server-side code is not recompiled. So we need to get back to terminal, stop this process, and run .NET run again. But this is very tedious. We don't want to stop this process and run it again every time we modify our C-sharp code. So let me show you a better way. In Google, search for .NET watch. So here the first link is a GitHub page, ASP.NET slash .NET tools. On this page, if you scroll down, we can see a link to .NET Watch. Now on the .NET Watch page, you can see this code that you need to copy and paste into your csproj file. So copy, back in VS Code, I'm gonna go to viga.csproj, and just below the project element, I'm gonna paste this code. So we have an item group, and inside this item group, we have a .NET CLI tool reference. And here in the include attribute, you can see the name of the assembly, Microsoft.NET Watcher Tools. Save. Now back in terminal, we need to run .NET Restore. This command will look at the references in our csproj and would get them from NuGet, just like how we do npm install. This is the equivalent for the server-side code. All right, now, if you run .NET Watch, Beautiful, it's working. So instead of .NET run, we're gonna run .NET watch run. And this will set up a listener. So anytime you modify your C sharp code, it will automatically recompile your code on the fly. So this is my latest code. I'm throwing an exception here. And when I navigate to localhost port 5000, I get this exception. Now back here, I have removed this line. Save. In terminal, you can see the watch tool noticed a file change, which is homecontroller.cs. So it recompiled our application and restarted the server. Now this process restarting the server often takes a second or two. So during that time, your web application is not going to be accessible. All right, now back here, if I refresh, my homepage is working. So before going any further, add .NET watch to your project. Okay, one more thing I wanna show you here in VS Code is this debug panel here. Note the shortcut. On Mac, it's Shift, Command, and D, and on Windows, it's Shift, Control, D. So here we have full debugging experience, just like Visual Studio. On this panel, we have the list of local variables. Below that, we can add watches. Here we have our call stack, and below that, we have all the breakpoints in the application. So here in the index action, we can put a breakpoint on this line, exactly like Visual Studio. We can also add or remove a breakpoint using F9. Okay, now we can start the debugger with F5. However, in debug console, note that we have an IO exception and it's coming from server.kestrel.dll. Now, if you look at the stack trace, you can see this error message here. Port auto in use. And the reason for that is because we have started our server on port 5000 in our terminal window. So this port is already in use. We need to stop this process, get back here and restart the debugging session. So with F5, now at this point .NET crashes, you can simply ignore it and restart the debugger. So F5 one more time. So this will launch a new browser window and now you can see my breakpoint is activated. All the shortcuts we have in Visual Studio for debugging code are also available here. So with F10, we can step over a line. With F11, we can step into a method. With Shift and F11, we can step out of it. We can restart the debugger using Shift, Command, and F5 on Mac, or Shift, Control, F5 on Windows. And we can stop the debugger using Shift and F5. Now, if I open the debug panel with Shift, Command, and D, look, we've got our local variables here, our watches, our call stack, and all the breakpoints. And the last thing I wanna show you here is this Git panel. Again, look at the shortcut, Control, Shift, and G. So here we can initialize our Git repository. We can see all the files that are changed, you can click any of these files and do a diff 
But in this case, because all these files are new, there is no previous version. And finally, you can commit them to your Git repository right here. So initial commit. You can also work with Git in the terminal. So Git add everything, Git commit, whatever. Now, if you're not familiar with Git, that's perfectly fine. Don't worry about it. It's not something that you need to know in order to take this course. But if you're a bit more experienced, I want you to know that here you can also use Git inside VS Code. So our project is ready and you have some familiarity with these new tools for building ASP.NET Core applications. Next, we're gonna revisit our Vega project requirements and get ready for our first challenge. One of the common questions I get from my students is, Mosh, how do I get started? I've got this project, I don't know what is the first step. I don't know what to do next. So in this lecture, I'm gonna show you a systematic approach to build software. Every software application starts with the requirements document. Now this requirements document can be one page, it can be 500 pages, or it can be just a verbal discussion between a few people. Irrespective of how big this requirements document is, your first task is to extract the use cases in this application. Use cases are the actions that the user can perform. Here are some examples. The user should be able to create vehicles, update vehicles, view vehicles, sort them, filter them, upload photos, and so on. Just write this down on a piece of paper. Keep it very simple. Now, once you have these use cases, you need to find their dependency. So we can start anywhere in the list. Let's say filter vehicles. In order for us to build this feature, first we need a list of vehicles. And in order to build this vehicle list, first we should be able to create vehicles. So we can store them in a database and then we can view them in a list. So here's the order to implement these use cases. We're gonna start with creating a vehicle first. Once we deliver that function, then we move on to the second step, the second task, which is listing the vehicles. And finally, the third task, filtering vehicles. Now, what is critical for you to understand here is that when you're building the list of vehicles, you should not worry about all the other fancy features like filtering, sorting, pagination, and so on. This is a mistake that a lot of junior developers make. They try to do so many things at once. And that's why they get lost in detail and deliver poor quality software. So focus entirely on building a list of vehicles. And that list doesn't even have to be fancy. Render the vehicles in a very simple list. Once it's working, then you can make it look better. You can apply some styles, you can add icons and so on. Once you deliver that feature, then move on to the third step. Filtering vehicles. At this point, you should isolate your mind and you shouldn't think about anything else. Like this is the only and the last feature of this application you need to build. So in our current dependency graph, we're gonna start with create vehicles use case. Now for this use case, what I do is to sketch a simple form. So earlier in the requirements, I told you about the attributes of the vehicles we need to store. So every vehicle should have a make, and model and a few other attributes. So here in our form, we need a dropdown list for the vehicle make. Once the user selects a value from this dropdown list, then the model dropdown list should be repopulated because models are based on the makes. Now what is important here is that the items in these two dropdown lists come from the server. Because in our application, somewhere in our database, we need to register all the standard makes and models. Now, similarly, we need a list of features that are available in this vehicle. So here we need a checkbox list and the items in this list are rendered dynamically. So again, we need to store the list of standard features in our database. And this data should come from the server. So back to our dependency graph, you wanna build this feature, create vehicle. In order to build this, first we need an Angular form. Now this form needs its data from the server. So in order to build this form, first we need an API. We need one or more API endpoints so we can get the data to populate this form. Next, in order to build this API, we need a database to store our data. But how do we create our database? We are gonna use Entity Framework Code First Migrations. So first we create our domain model and then use Code First Migrations to generate 
or update our database. So this is the approach that I always follow in every project. Now we want to reduce the scope here. We want to focus on a small piece of functionality. So first we want to build this API and that's your first challenge. So over this week, I want you to build these two API endpoints to get the list of vehicles makes and their models, as well as their features. So everything you learn in ASP.NET MVC 5 to build APIs applies in ASP.NET Core as well. There are some subtle differences. So I have attached a PDF for you to this lecture where you can find all the necessary information about transitioning from ASP.NET MVC 5 to ASP.NET Core for the purpose of this exercise. Sometime next week, I'm going to publish my solution so you can see how I will go ahead and build this feature step by step. So go ahead, get started, and I will see you next week. So I hope you've been watching this video up to this point. If you want to have this course for $15, click on the link in the video description and join my mailing list now. Next week, when I publish the course, I will send you a coupon to get the course. Thank you and have a great day.